this is the unsolved murder of Lavena Johnson. Lavena became a private first class of the United States Army and was stationed in Belad, Iraq. She would frequently call her parents to update them on her experience. On July 17th, Lavena called her parents, telling them that she would be home early for Christmas and she seemed very excited. Only a couple days later, her family received a call from soldiers saying that Lavena committed suicide. However, there was no indication that she was suicidal. At 1.20 a.m., her body was found in a pool of blood next to an M16 rifle that seemed a little bit too far away from her. An autopsy was done and they ruled it a suicide. However, the parents were not buying it. The gunshot wound came from the left side. However, she was right-handed. Her nose was broken and her lips were very cut. Also, her gloves were glued to her hands. That was not normal protocol. The family hired a private investigator who found some more evidence. She had a black eye, loose teeth, and corrosive liquid poured onto her genitals. Her family is still seeking justice. The strangest unsolved mysteries from each state. Today, we have Arkansas. On August 23rd, 1987, Kevin Ives and Don Henry both went hunting together in a wooded area. They were near some train tracks, which was also very close to Don's house in Bryant, Arkansas. A train was making its usual night run to Little Rock when the engineer noticed something very strange. There were two boys lying on the train tracks, but despite all of the honking, they wouldn't get up or even move a muscle. And so he tried to emergency brake, but it didn't work and he ended up hitting them and killing them. A medical examiner determined that they were really high and they had smoked about 20 joints. But when both of these boys' families were told that, they, they didn't believe it. When they were killed, they were covered in light green tarp with Don's rifle next to them on the ground. Don's family said that he would have never left his rifle on the ground to get scratched and that no matter how high they were, they would have woken up to all of the honking and the noise. Kevin's family hired a private investigator, and every time he would try to talk to the cops, they'd be so unwilling and resistant to talk to him. A different autopsy was conducted, and it turns out they only smoked one to three joints, and they were dead before they were even hit. It just doesn't make sense. This case is strange. Joshua Maddox went missing in 2008, and he wasn't found until 2015. When an unused cabin a quarter mile away from his home was being demolished, his body was found inside the chimney with his knees above his head, and the police ruled it an accidental death, and they said he climbed in from the top and got stuck. But that doesn't explain how he got in the chimney, because there was a metal grate on top of it blocking the entrance, and he couldn't have gone in through the fireplace because there was a heavy breakfast bar that had been ripped out of the wall and pushed in front of it or why he was only wearing a shirt. All his other clothes were folded up inside the cabin. So he would have had to have been inside the cabin, taken off his clothes, gone outside, climbed up on the roof, and then tried to enter the cabin again through the chimney? This woman received mysterious calls for months before something terrible happened. In 1980, Dorothy Jane Scott began receiving threatening calls from an unidentified man. It got so bad she started taking karate classes and contemplated buying a gun. But then on May 28, 1980, co-workers witnessed her car recklessly speeding out of a parking lot. The next day, her car was found burning in an alleyway with no one inside. Then a week after her disappearance, her parents began receiving mysterious phone calls from a man that were too short to be traced. They got a phone call almost every Wednesday afternoon. This went on for four years until Dorothy's skeletal remains were found buried along with the bones of a dog. After her remains were recovered, her parents received one last phone call from the man who said, is Dorothy home? Have you heard of this more recent unsolved murder? 29-year-old Elizabeth Barraza was murdered right in her driveway in Tumball, Texas. On the morning of January 25th, 2019, she was holding a garage sale right in her driveway because she was getting ready to go on her anniversary trip. To celebrate their five-year wedding anniversary, Elizabeth and her husband were going to head down to Universal Studios, Florida. The two loved many fandoms, including Star Wars, and they were actually part of their Stormtroopers 501st group, where they did charity events at children's hospitals and other places. She had decided to do the garage sale because they wanted a little bit extra spending money to take with them for their fun trip. So she got started at 6 a.m. on January 25th. What happens next was caught on her neighbor's ring camera. Follow in heart for part two. The murder of Elizabeth Barraza, part two. So I mentioned in the last part that her neighbor caught everything on a ring camera. Here's what happened. An unknown person drove up to Elizabeth's house in a black Nissan Frontier. They got out, they spoke for a moment, which we now know she said, good morning, meaning she did not know who this person was. After that, the person shot her three times, she fell to the ground, there was a pause, they shot her a fourth time. After that, they got back into their truck, 
fled the scene. Neighbors heard the gunshots and called 911 right away. Sadly, she had died on the scene. The vehicle would be spotted in surrounding neighborhoods and businesses, but even to this day, they still do not know who the killer is. A more recent update, just a couple months ago, the police said that they feel confident that they are on the way to catch her killer. So here's for hoping justice for Elizabeth and her family gets answers. So what really happened to Michelle von Ermster? Because her death is bizarre. She was found during the early morning hours of April 15th, 1994, off the coast of San Diego, but her body hadn't been in the water long since she was last seen at 8 p.m. the night before. She was missing her right leg from the thigh down and had tearing type tissue damage, so the medical examiner ruled it a great white shark attack, but he had never even seen a shark attack death before. But that didn't explain her broken neck, pelvis, and ribs, or why her severed leg bone was whittled into a point and she had a lot of sand in her mouth stomach and lungs meaning she had to been pressed into the sand while breathing in and she was found naked and it's unlikely she went swimming that way since both the water and air temperatures at night were in the 50s the strangest unsolved mysteries from each state today by popular demand we have oregon and yeah it's oregon so i could tell you about bigfoot or ted bundy but we're gonna do something a little more interesting i am going to tell you about the little lava lake murders Blech. Ed, Roy, and Dewey were all trappers, and for three months in the winter, they would stay in their cabin at Little Lava Lake and do their job. When spring came around, friends and family of the men would come up and visit them. And when they all arrived, the three men would normally greet them, but it didn't happen this time. While everybody was looking for them, somebody ventured into the trapper's shed and found a blood-stained hammer. As they looked more, they discovered a patch of snow with blood in it. And as they dug down a few inches deeper, in the slush was a human tooth mixed with human hair. Once the snow had melted, they were walking on the ice that was covering the lake, and they discovered a hole that had been dug in the ice, and that is where they disposed of the bodies. That hole had been cut in the dead of winter. The bodies were wrapped in muslin, and I quote, fiendishly butchered. I'm running out of time, but part two is coming right now. Most people know about the strange happenings in the Bermuda Triangle, but what about the Bennington Triangle? It's in southern Vermont, and it's known as a place where people disappear. It began in 1945 when a 74-year-old hunting guide vanished without a trace, and then almost a year later, on December 1st, 1946, 18-year-old Paula Weldon went for a hike and never came back. Then three years to the day of Weldon's disappearance, 68-year-old James E. Tedford was seen by multiple witnesses boarding the bus at the last stop before Bennington. But when the bus arrived, he was gone, but his luggage was still there. In October 1950, 8-year-old Paul Jepson went missing, and then just two weeks later, 53-year-old Frieda Langer, an experienced hiker, went missing in the mountains. And despite extensive searches for all these people, the only body ever found was Langer, months later, in a place that had already been extensively searched people probably don't know about this case and it's it's one of the most intriguing unsolved mysteries that i've heard of in my whole life and I'm, i've heard of a lot of unsolved mysteries but this one still is very 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 intriguing now there's speculation that she was killed over drugs there's speculation that she was killed over some sort of a sex harassment, sexual harassment, rape lawsuit that was going on in the police department at the time. This was in the late 80s, early 90s, so the law probably would have been more on the side of the attacker as opposed to the attackee, I will say that. And then there's speculation that she really did just kill herself because of all of the sexual harassment rape lawsuit that was going on, that she just was too weak as a police officer mind you, that she was just too weak and couldn't handle the stress of it. So if you don't already know what this unsolved case file is, I'm about to tell you. So it comes in this folder and it gives you a whole bunch of different evidence and pictures and everything like that. There's, this is my first time opening it, but I think in here there's different photographs of the crime and all this stuff newspaper articles and it all looks super realistic and pretty much you just have to figure out what happened to her and solve the crime and this is the girl that i'm doing my cold case on her name is jamie banks so i'm super excited to get into this and see what the outcome is it looks so much fun